Welcome to the Cot Key Ride Home for Tuesday, May 11th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. A new book digs into the origins of Amazon's Alexa and allegedly reveals the woman who provided the voice for their original virtual assistant. A teenage wannabe influencer from France is set to be Italy's next queen. Didn't think Italy had royal leaders anymore? You're right, and someone should tell this noble family that. And screw the free donuts and half-hearted store coupons we have as incentives in America, Romania is offering vaccinations inside Dracula's castle. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. So there's a new book out from Silicon Valley journalist Brad Stone called Amazon Unbound, Jeff Bezos and the Invention of a Global Empire. And an excerpt printed today in Wired, which walks us through the origins of Amazon's Alexa, casually includes one detail that is actually pretty massive, the identity of Alexa. Also, apologies if you were listening to this on a speaker near your device. I'm also going to mention the Apple one, so maybe put your headphones in or listen on one and a half time to try to trick your device or something. So one thing I found interesting right off the bat is that Bezos originally wanted different voices associated with different types of tasks. So a different voice for listening to music versus placing an order. Having over a dozen different voices, however, would be tricky, especially at the outset of an already ambitious project. Now, Amazon had already signed on a partnership with Polish company Ivona, which was an early leader in text-to-speech technology, with over 40 voices in 20 languages in 2012. Now, Amazon needed to develop their own voice, and having made the decision to go with just one for now, they made a list of priorities for the characteristics the voice should evoke, which include, quoting Stone in Wired, trustworthiness, empathy, and warmth, which they determined those traits were more commonly associated with a female voice, end quote. And they also didn't want the voice to have a regional accent. So they teamed up with a voiceover studio in Atlanta called GM Voices, who had already worked with Apple to create Siri from voice actress Susan Bennett's recordings. GM Voices sent a selection of candidates to the Amazon team who spent months narrowing them down before presenting their final choice to Bezos to sign off on. Quoting Stone, Characteristically secretive, Amazon has never revealed the name of the voice artist behind Alexa. I learned her identity after canvassing the professional voiceover community. Boulder, Colorado-based voice actress and singer Nina Roll. Her professional website contains links to old radio ads for products such as Mott's Apple Juice and Volkswagen's Passat, and the warm timbre of Alexa's voice is unmistakable. Roll said she wasn't allowed to talk to me when I reached out to her on the phone in February 2021, and when I asked Amazon to speak with her, they declined. End quote. The Verge says that neither Roll nor Amazon will confirm or deny Roll's role as Alexa, but they did dig up some of those old ads from her website and, well, listen for yourself. Come to Cherry Creek North this winter, Denver's premier outdoor retail destination, where you can experience the unexpected treasures of the season, including the season itself. Fairly uncanny. Now, I'm a little hesitant to even be amplifying this story because while it's entirely possible that Amazon is the one who doesn't want her identity revealed, and a lot of these companies see discussing the voice talent as a distraction from the kind of perfect digital voice they're going for, but it could also be Roll herself who doesn't want the attention. Susan Bennett, the voice of Siri, publicly revealed herself back in 2013 after fellow voice actor Allison Dufty was incorrectly assumed to be Siri. Dufty was used in a video created by The Verge about how Siri's voice technology works, which misled many to believe she was the actual voice of Siri. Bennett went public to clear things up and says she initially kept her identity as the real Siri quiet because she wasn't sure she wanted the notoriety. Now, while things seem to have gone fine for Bennett, it's good she was able to reveal herself on her own terms, because she didn't actually agree to being Siri in the first place. As a career voice actress, and one who has spent a lot of time providing the voice for phone lines and other machines like ATMs, when GM Voices asked her to record her voice for a database that would be used to construct speech for a company called Scansoft, she didn't think too much about it. She didn't know her voice would be used by Apple, let alone as the voice of its groundbreaking new technology, until a colleague who got the new iPhone 4S emailed her and said, Hey, we've been playing around with this new Apple phone. Isn't this you? 
It's worked out for Bennett. She has plenty of fun stories, like of her son yelling at his phone, Mom, stop, when Siri gives him overly detailed GPS directions. But her story does make it entirely conceivable that Nina Roll wasn't aware she was becoming the voice of Alexa when she recorded for them years ago herself. And while the actors behind other international versions of Siri have gone public, being the voice behind one of these systems, or their earlier counterparts, is not all fun. Yes, a a popular Polish actor, was recruited to provide the database of sounds for Ivona, the Polish company Amazon bought when they first started working on Alexa. And Labiak's voice ended up being used in tons of different products, elevators, subways, robocalls, quoting Stone, Pranksters manipulated the software to have him say inappropriate things, and posted the clips online where his children discovered them. The Ivona founders then had to renegotiate the actor's contract after he angrily tried to withdraw his voice from the software. End quote. Of course, Labiak was already a popular public figure, so the pranks and the ramifications therein had a bit more to do with that. But still, as excited as some of us may be to put a name and face to the incorporeal virtual assistant, my hope is that people writ large don't really care. So Roll can just use this as a means of slightly boosting her career, but not face any backlash for it. And also, Stone could be wrong. Sure, Roll does sound a bit like Alexa, and she's a voice actor at the studio that was used, but unless either party comes forward, we'll never really know. And as The Verge points out, quote, Although we can hear both Bennett and Roll's voices in their AI doppelgangers, it's impossible to say without inside knowledge exactly what traces of the original remain. Creating a synthetic voice starts with real audio samples, but this data is exhaustively quantized and remastered to such a degree that answering the question of whether the final product is the same as the original is best reserved for the shipbuilders of Theseus. End quote. And if you want to read more about the process of creating Alexa and the first Amazon Echo, definitely check out the full excerpt from Stone's book in Wired. And if you want to read a little bit more about Susan Bennett's experience becoming Siri, check the CNN link in the show notes. So, being American, I'll admit that I don't understand too much about monarchies. But I was pretty sure Italy no longer had one. And they don't. They haven't had one for 75 years. But I guess they still have a royal family? At least depending on who you ask. Especially if the people you're asking are some of the members of that formerly royal family. That family, the House of Savoy, made headlines this week because Vittorio Emanuele de Savoia, the exiled son of the last king of Italy, has named his teenage French influencer granddaughter the next heir. A sort of sweet 16 birthday gift to her, and a break from tradition that would make her the first woman in a millennia to hold the eventual title. Except that the title doesn't really mean anything, and apparently no one in Italy cares. Well, except for the other half of the family who had claims to the throne. So the granddaughter, now 17, is Vittoria Cristina Chiara Adelaide Maria, we'll call her Vittoria. Her grandfather, Vittorio, is the Duke of Savoy, Prince of Naples, and direct heir to the head of the House of Savoy. In order to name his granddaughter Vittoria the next head of house, he had to amend a medieval law that dictated succession only go to male heirs. So, of course, other male heirs from the family, like Prince Emone de Savoia e Asta, say this move is, quote, totally illegitimate. The New York Times calls it, quote, the latest chapter in an ongoing dynastic dispute between the pretenders to Italy's pretend throne, end quote. The Aosta side of the family has long had a beef with the Carignano Savoia side, at least since Vittorio, the grandfather and exiled son of the last king, married a non-noble competitive water skier. Even after being allowed back in the country, he apparently tended to offend Italians. He's been charged with illegal gambling and other seedy business, and uh, he also killed a person in the 70s when he accidentally shot a German tourist from his yacht. He was acquitted, but, you know, I can't say I blame the Aosta side of the family for not liking him that much. Oh, also, at the 2004 wedding of the future King Felipe VI of Spain, Vittorio punched his cousin, the Duke of Aosta, in the face twice. So yeah, this is a legit rivalry. Vittoria's dad, meanwhile, Emmanuel Filiberto, who calls himself the Prince of Venice, and who is also an Italian TV personality and Los Angeles restaurant owner, 
who you'd think would be next in line and kind of miffed by this whole thing, was actually really pleased. He doesn't have any sons and says that someone will have to be the head of the royal household while he prefers to essentially abdicate. He also thinks that the monarchy could return, not exactly soon, but never say never, he said. For the record, basically no Italians want the monarchy to return, and even the ones living in the ancestral home of this branch of the Savoy family, Carignano, have no clue who Vittoria is. So apart from weird wealthy people politics and egos, why is the family doing this? Is it a stunt to boost Vittoria's Instagram profile? Because it's apparently been working, even though her 36,000 followers is not exactly the burgeoning influencer level the New York Times touts. Not quite. Paolo Castagno, a local historian in Carignano, says it's completely about money. Quoting the Times, Only heirs to the throne, he said, control the orders that distribute noble titles in exchange for lucrative payments to the family. By changing inheritance law, Vittorio Emanuel ensured his branch a future revenue stream and prestige. End quote. It's just convenient that by naming a granddaughter, they can wrap it up in claims of women's rights. Which, like, kind of, but I think real women's rights would probably be equitable treatment of all women, not hoarding wealth for a few of them, but baby steps, I suppose. Vittoria's dad, for his part, seems to be in it for more than just money. He's also in it for fame, or at least enjoying how cool his lot in life is. His L.A. restaurant is called, after him, Prince of Venice, and he's currently pitching a crown-style TV series about his grandmother, Queen Marie Jusée. Which, I mean, I doubt he would, but if the show included all this Hatfields and McCoy-style drama between the two sides of the family, that could actually be a pretty interesting TV show. And that rival Aosta side of the family, for their part, is trying to claim that the long-standing law about only having male heirs that was changed for Vittoria should not be amended until the monarchy is actually restored. But the Savoyas are proceeding as if Vittoria's claim to the non-existent throne will go along as planned. Her dad Emmanuel is trying to prepare her by getting her to study more and occasionally having her release Instagram videos on more serious topics like the rights of French private school students. Vittoria seems a little nervous and stressed by the whole thing, but is trying to adapt. She's not overly familiar with Italian life and culture, more accustomed to her home life in France, telling the times of her perception of Italy as not being very progressive, quote, they will learn, end quote. Really, she just wants to become a fashion designer, but it seems like she'll have to devote at least some time to being the head of her family's pretend royal family. As the New York Times summed it up in their article, which, by the way, is worth the read because it is just dripping with sarcasm, quote, Uneasy lies the head that wears an imaginary crown, end quote. So I got both my doses of the vaccine at the Javits Center in Manhattan, which is home to, among many other things, New York Comic Con. So I thought that was pretty cool. But then I saw that the American Museum of Natural History had become a vaccine site, and at least if the photos were anything to go by, and photos are always true, you could get your vaccine beneath the big blue whale in the Hall of Ocean Life. And you even got a voucher for four people for a free day at the museum. So needless to say, I completely regret my decisions. But now, Romania has gone and done one even cooler. They went and made Dracula's Castle a vaccination site. So Bran Castle, which is called Dracula's Castle despite having no known connection to Vlad the Impaler or Bram Stoker's novel, but which has been a tourist attraction and national landmark since the 70s, is offering free Pfizer vaccines to anyone who visits the castle, no appointment necessary. Healthcare workers at the castle are decked out with fang stickers and there are big signs and posters depicting vampire-adjacent imagery, like one of menacing-looking teeth, but the canines are replaced by syringes. It's something. The initiative is twofold. One, tourism has been down in Romania, like everywhere else, so they hope it will bring more people out to the castle. But also, Romania has one of the highest rates of vaccine hesitancy in Europe, so the nation is hopeful that the fun Dracula branding will convince more people to get vaccinated. And to sweeten the deal, anyone who gets the vaccine there gets free admission to the castle's medieval torture exhibit, as well as a certificate welcoming them to the castle for the coming 100 years. As Alexandra Prashu, Brand Castle's marketing director, put it to Reuters, quote, The idea was to show how people got jabbed 500 to 600 years ago in Europe, end quote. 
Now, Romania has a number of other initiatives they're running to up their vaccination numbers, but as the AV Club puts it, all the rest of them, quote, pale in comparison to being able to boast that your vaccine was administered in a place that also gives free medieval torture exhibition passes along with it, end quote. One last quick story for you that is as heartwarming as it is unbelievable. A woman who was on a flight from Salt Lake City to Honolulu to go on vacation with her family unexpectedly gave birth during the flight. And I don't mean unexpectedly like she just went into early labor. No, she had no clue she was pregnant. This happens sometimes and often results in an early labor, which can be really dangerous, so having it occur mid-flight could have ended in tragedy. But fortunately for Lavinia Munga, there was a doctor on the flight. But get this, there wasn't just one doctor on the flight, there also happened to be three NICU nurses on the flight as well. That's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, the place where babies go when they're born super early or with other medical needs. How wild of a coincidence to have three professionals who know exactly how to care for premature babies on the flight when you unexpectedly give birth to a premature baby. Now, of course, they were without the high-tech equipment, usually filling a NICU, so they had to improvise. The nurses and doctor tied the baby's umbilical cord with shoelaces and used someone's Apple Watch to monitor his heart rate. Medical response teams met the mom and new baby as soon as the plane landed, and they were transferred to a local hospital where they appear to be doing well. I just can't get over how lucky they were. I mean, what are the odds? Absolutely wild. But that is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. 